This is Naomi Judd. On today's show, rarely has the man of the cloth been so down with the boys and girls in the hood. When you're ready, come on in. Meet a Jesuit priest who's just one of the homeboys. And when Dr. Ethan Teves took a summer vacation, he left it all behind, including 270 pounds of fat. I had a size 60 waist. That's oh. five feet around. We'll see how his amazing story is now inspiring others. And we'll meet an enterprising young man whose business is saving lives. A lot of these kids get abandoned. Our goal is to be their advocates. So, pour yourself another cup of coffee. I'm Naomi Judd, and it's a brand new morning. Every day's a new day. Every day's a new way. To help somebody who needs somebody like you. There's a power you can pass along. To heal a heart and make it strong. There's hope with every dawn. Every day's a new day. Hi. Good morning to you. You have bright eyed and bushy tails. Happy, happy to see you. You doing okay? Everybody all right? You know, sometimes when you ask a person, um, how's it going? How you doing? They'll just say, oh, same old, same old. Well, pardon me, but your rut is showing. One of the things we're going to uh, be talking about today is that science has discovered that it's just not healthy to be stuck in a rut, not for our spirit or our mind or our body. And we're going to meet a bunch of folks who got fresh starts after they figured out, I love this, the only difference between a rut and a grave is the size, is the dimensions. But when these folks figured out how to climb up and out of their rut, they saw a whole new way to have a fresh start. So we're going to talk about how to make a fresh start. And my first story is about some young people who sure needed one. They were gang members down in L.A. And the most unlikely of people, a man is now providing them with a second chance who's a very, well, let's just say he's a very colorful character himself. Watch this story. You get your hands up. Get your hands up. Come over here. My first daughter, her dad was murdered because the, you know, gang related. I thought my life was over for a minute. You know that I thought I wasn't gonna be able to do nothing. I grew up around gang members, you know, so I joined them as, as I started growing up. Started doing a lot of bad things, stealing cars, going to jail. Yeah. People always ask about what's the appeal of gangs, and, and I, I'm of the opinion there is no appeal, there is no lure, there is no draw or attraction. Um, there is no pull factor. It's only push factor. I've never met a hopeful kid who joined a gang. So at the level of prevention, you always want to engage them and stoke the pilot light of hope. If you can inject a sense of sure and certain hope, if you can, where there is no hope, you invent it, you know, and that's what you want to do. And uh, this is about the invention of hope at this place. We're the largest gang intervention program in the country. We have thousands of folks who walk through here we remove thousands of tattoos, locate thousands of jobs, uh, counseling, and run our businesses where enemies work side by side with each other. Me and the other girls that work here, we're ba we basically come from the same place, different neighborhoods, different gangs, but we all been through kind of the same thing. We're all single parents. They have to struggle, but at least they can think that we believe in them, and we do. Gangs are bastions of conditional love. One false move and, and you're out. Homeboy industry seeks to be a community of unconditional love. So what it does is it creates and fosters a sense of resilience. Father Greg gave me the opportunity and help, as, you know, by giving me a job and basically, you know, like to understand what was going on. Pretty much, you know, I just live day by day. Be responsible. Respect people, 
and most most likely respect yourself. When you're ready, come on in. All right, that's what I'm saying. We help anybody who comes over. We'll see how we can get, do we have to get the people to come here, the families or? Or just or tell or anybody that we'll, we'll help anybody who walks through those doors. Yeah. So, if you believe that God is compassionate, loving kindness, you're asked only to do one thing, and that is to be in the world who God is. So this place isn't about announcing a message, it's about becoming that message. This isn't about, let's take, uh, the, here's the spiritual part, let's take 15 minutes of prayer. You know, it's, no, it's about welcoming the stranger. It's about uh, standing with those who are uh, on the margins, people who are left out. Okay, my dog. All right, thank you. We actually see here. Oh, damn. Well, actually, um, I did a crime. I did a crime. Um, you know, I didn't want to learn the easy way. You know, I had to learn the hard way. You know, I did a crime. They wanted to give me um, 12 years in prison. 12 years in prison, I ended up taking the deal. I took the two strikes with two years. And I went to up north, up in Old Folsom State Prison. So I decided I'm gonna, as soon as I come out, I'm going to go straight to Father G's office. If you had seen Gabriel walking down the street, you know, you might clutch your kids a little more closely. You know, you might, you might walk to the other side of the street. But I defy anybody on the planet Earth to spend, you know, five minutes with Gabriel and not come away and say, I've just been in the presence of somebody pretty extraordinary. He hired me on the spot. You know, son, I'm going to hire you. Ever since now, I've been out for a year and a half, you know, became a supervisor, been to the White House, been lower Bush. It's pretty cool, you know. The goal around here is kinship. It's not justice. It's not peace. Because I know if we have kinship, you're going to have peace. If you have kinship, you're going to have justice. If you focus on justice or peace, you're not going to get it. Because, you know, justice and peace are always about something else. Gang violence is about something else. Find the something else. Find the, address the lethal absence of hope and, you, and you're, you've done a lot. I want him for president. When he said it's not about justice or peace, but if we focus on kinship. Okay, but first we got to welcome our homegirls <laughs> back to the program. I like that title. <laughs> we got to come up with some kind of little. Yeah. 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 Well, sure. I don't yeah. know what it is. We'll work on it. <laughs> I, obviously, we're not from here. <laughs> Rabbi Sherry Hirsch Hi. and Reverend Susan Sparks. Homegirls. And there was just so much stuff in that. I, know. I, know. I loved what he just said about you have to invent hope when yeah. there is no hope because. You can't make a fresh start just because you suddenly want to make one. You need someone to give you a leg up. Yes. And people think you can't go from the projects to Harvard Law School. You have to have someone help you, and he does that. Yeah, you know, I'd say when you find a turtle up on a fence post, it had some help getting up there. <laughs> yeah, seriously, Somebody. I didn't even think of that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, that's what ministry is about. I, I think about it. It's one thing to tell people they should live a just life. It's yeah. another thing to empower them to live a just life and mm -hmm. show the way. And speaking of fresh starts, of course, a vacation is a way to give us a fresh perspective on, from our comfortable, familiar world to see how other people live. Well, we're going to see how much a summer trip around the country changed our next guest's world, and I mean his whole world. And then later on, we've got a family whose world was rocked forever because of the incredible work of one young man. When, when we take a trip, we put on a few pounds, but oh no, not my next guest. This man's vacation involves some amazing numbers, 38,000 miles of driving, 110 baseball games, and 270 pounds lost. Okay, here he is before his trip. Ay, ay, ay. Are you sitting on two chairs there? My goodness. And da, 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 here he is today. Please welcome Dr. Nick Efantides. <laughs> Woo! Whoa! <laughs> cool! Are you 6'2? 6'2? Six two? Six two? <laughs> oh my gosh! Good to see you. I mean, I. I read the book, but I hadn't seen you until just now, and I was just like, Psh. Fun, isn't it? 
<laughs> Hot. Okay. First of all, you're a doctor. I am. You know, I'm a nurse, and you know, Nick, my first question was, didn't you feel like a hypocrite? I was board certified in medical hypocrisy. I spent every day. <laughs> I spent every day of my life telling my patients, do as I say, not as I do. But you want to know something interesting. I actually have worked exclusively with the uninsured and with the poor. Uh -huh. And so in some ways, my weight was like an occupational blessing because in the eyes of a lot of people, I was like a modern-day medical Santa Claus. Oh, so they related to you. In a sense, people felt very accepted. You know, when you're a doctor yeah. who weighs as much as I did, you don't have the luxury or the opportunity to wave your finger in people's faces. I was a very humble and meek and jovial kind of guy. I did my best to project a happy-go-lucky image as best as possible. And then what was the turning point? A health crisis, completely unrelated to my weight. I was brought to my knees and came to my senses when in the midst of everything I was diagnosed with testicular cancer, mm -hmm. just like Lance Armstrong. Mm -hmm. So you might be thinking you're half the man you used to be in more ways than one. <laughs> <laughs> the guys out there are going, hey. <laughs> But honestly, it took cancer uh -huh. for me, even as a doctor, to realize something very simple yet something very profound. My health is a gift from God. Yes. I could no longer take it for granted. And here I was, I dodged the cancer bullet. Uh-huh. And I was eating myself to death at the same time. And, of course, we know that uh, dietary factors can contribute to cancer. They can. This kind of testicular cancer isn't necessarily directly related, but there are many cancers now that seem to be developing in association with right. our eating and behavioral patterns. And you weighed, I mean, you say it. <laughs> it. It won't even come out you weighed so much. It's hard to believe. 467 pounds of pure, unadulterated love. <laughs> I had a size 60 waist. That's oh, five feet around. Oh. <laughs> a, know, a human parachute. You know, I have to ask, what was your self-esteem like? You know, Naomi, I did my best to project a jovial image. But internally, I was a mess. I was yeah. a hypocrite. I felt unfulfilled. I was lonely. The fat, in many ways, was a barrier to me. I uh -huh. was a very unhappy unfulfilled man who was living in a sense in my excess of calories I was depriving myself of what I believe God intends for life to be all about. You don't have to answer this but I know um, that we're eating to fill a spiritual void some sort of emotional hunger some issue did you ever figure out what your core issue was? Absolutely and to me that's one of the things that I'm trying to share with people is we need to spend a little less time looking at what we eat uh -huh. and contemplate and come to discover what's eating us. And to yeah. me... Hey, hey, hey. Got to say that again. I like that. Say it again. We've got to stop focusing on what we eat uh -huh. and look more at what is eating us. And I was using for f the food for all the wrong reasons. Food is not Valium on a plate. It is not your best friend. It mm -hmm. should not be where you turn for companionship to deal with your loneliness, your anxiety, your mm -hmm. stress. For me, it was an uphill avalanche. The more stressful life got, mm -hmm. the more calories I consumed. I love this book because we are, as I always say, we're a spirit and a mind and a body. And all these diet crazes and the billions of dollars we spend on diet stuff, does it work? I loved this book. Can you, just for me, because I don't know if I can go right to it or not, but you talked about the yellow caution light. That was, I'm so practical. I loved what you said about, well, you Tell well, us. Thank you. Yeah, let me explain. The book could be summarized in one sentence. You have to change the way you see before you can change the way you look. Okay. To me, in order to change your weight, you have to change your life. Mm. To change your health, you've got to change your behavior. Yeah. And one of those behaviors that to some people comes naturally was my habit of eating past the point of my body being appropriately satisfied. I had to rediscover the experience of eating to satisfaction, not on every meal, eating to the point of being packed like a cannon or a Thanksgiving yeah. turkey. And so I use the analogy of red light, green light, yellow light, that when we're hungry, the light is green. When we're starting to get satiated, the light of our body turns yellow, then red. It's about having a healthy relationship with food. Now I want to hear about this weight loss journey that you went on. You know, Naomi, as a guy who used to work over 90 hours a week, I was a politician teaching at a medical school. I had 55 physicians working for me, all of us doing charitable care in Southern California. 
I decided I needed a radical sabbatical. And after lots of prayer <laughs> I love and thought, these word plays. Well, because they you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about it, I came up with the idea, why not combine doing something fun mm. with something healthy? I love this country, and I happen to love America's pastime, which is baseball. Baseball, <laughs> me too. And so over the course of a season, I went to every state in America, went to every major league ballpark, went on 38,000 miles. Drove 38,000 miles to every state but Hawaii and Alaska that I flew to. And without having surgery, without taking any magic potions, by changing my life, I lost 270 pounds. Wow. Now, of course, we associate beer and hot dogs <laughs> and chips and fried stuff with uh, parks. How'd you do it at baseball parks? For a lot of people, that's what it's all about at the ball game, eating, right? Well, yeah. for me, it was, ready for another little phrase? Yeah, I love Distraction it. from deprivation, which means I love the game so much yeah. that here I was in a new environment with all kinds of exciting things. I forgot the fact that I was hungry. It was a great way to do it. Now you're happily married. We've got to bring on your wife and baby. I want to see her. <laughs> I want to squeeze her. Veronica. Veronica. Veronique. And how do you say your wife's name? My Veronique. wife's name is Vespina. Vespina. So are you Greek as well? <laughs> Welcome to the show. God Hi, has been Angel so baby. generous. This is our little miracle because having had testicular cancer, yes, the opportunity to have somebody call me daddy, I didn't think would ever Apple. happen. Apple. You see, the apple apples are good for you. Yeah. You can have all the apples you want. <laughs> okay, so are you starting her off eating healthy? Yeah, we are. This is a journey of love. Uh -huh. I don't want to deprive my precious wife nor my daughter of the opportunity to have daddy around as long as possible. And I love them more than I love food. And here they are. Right, uh -huh. Baba Girl? There's so many people out there who are desperate and maybe have tried everything. I just really feel like your message is whole. This book is about spirit, mind, and body satiation and satisfaction. That's right. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. I'm so grateful to, to see you. Thank you. What a story. Thank you. Thank you. See, <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Angel Baby. And See, you bye don't bye. need junk food. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to know more about Dr. Nick's program and you want to find out if it's right for you, please do visit our website at faithstreams.com. To find out more, I read the book and I just, I loved every word of it. So after the break, we're going to come back and we're going to meet another family. This family has been forever changed by an organization originally started by a 16-year-old. This is good stuff. Let's do it today. Old, you're just lucky to have a job at the local department store, right? But it was at that very age, and this is only six years ago, that Matt DeLeo created China Care, an organization that has since transformed the lives of over 200 kids. For one special little girl and her family, China Care has changed everything. When we met Kylie, we were very nervous. We didn't know what to expect. I think she was abandoned at two weeks old. She was diagnosed with bilateral club feet. Kylie was so fragile when she came to China Care that if they hadn't come, she wouldn't have survived. China Care is kind of like the, I would say the, the intercessor, I don't know if that's the right word for it. But they, they go to bat for, for the little ones who can't, who can't help themselves. So I first went to China when I was three years old. At 16 years old, in 2000, I, I knew that I wanted to do something to go back to China, something to help, something to give back. I went over there and saw that 95% of the children in the orphanage I was at were disabled and that that was the one thing holding them back from being adopted. So I came here back to the U.S. and, and within half a year I started China Care. We are now at just over a million dollar a year operating budget and what that allows, that um, allows for five children's homes and we have under our care, under our 24-hour supervision, 400 plus kids. How, how many volunteers do we have right now? 
Okay, but we're trying to get that number up to like 60. I joke that all I need is a backpack, a computer, uh, you know, and a cell phone, and I'm set. That is all you need, you know. It's it's a, a lot of this is just communicating with people, trying to make stuff happen. You you know, you're pitching donors and you're trying to coordinate with China to make programs happen, and and that's all just it's communication. We actually had a friend who also volunteered for China Care, and she was going over with her sister to China. I said to her secretly, I said, okay, find me a baby. <laughs> she brought me Kylie's picture, and I said, yeah, this is her. <laughs> and I bonded instantly with that picture. It was wild to finally touch her and say, you're here. You're not, you're not two-dimensional anymore. I can, I can hold you. I can squeeze you. I can give you kisses. It was... It was amazing. The kids that we focus on are really the kids with medical problems. Because of nutritional problems, in the most cases, they're born with something like cleft lip, clubbed foot, heart problems, cleft lip surgery, $500. That's all it is, simple $500. That's nothing here. For the average Chinese, that's half of their salary. Half of a year's salary goes towards that surgery. They can't afford it. Um, and so a lot of these kids then get abandoned. Our goal is to be their advocates. I'm adopted, and I've been so blessed in my life. It just made sense to be able to bless someone else, to be able to give back. I get very warm feelings when I, when I look at Kylie. I look at her and I see myself. Ready? Is that good? From the time that we got Kylie to now, she's already trying to walk. She's standing, she's cruising along furniture. So it's one miracle after another. Ding dong! Good girl! I think that all China Care has made me realize that there are things that are far more important than materialism. I think that I have gained so much more than I have given. And, and you realize how much, really, by giving, you get. There are many babies at China Care um, rescues. These little ones are forgotten. They're abandoned either by choice or by force, by, you know, force of society or whatever. But unless someone intervenes, then they have no more life. They, they perish. And that was the situation with Kylie. She wouldn't have had a life in China. She, if they hadn't intervened, she would have either died or she would have been doomed to a life as a cripple begging on the streets. That breaks my heart thinking that could be my daughter. If we hadn't found her, that could be her. And I say, my God, you know, it's pretty amazing how, how far, you know, we've come to be able to come and have this life and to be able to give that life. It's okay. Reverend Susan's sitting over here going, okay, there's a sermon, there's a sermon topic, there's another to sermon topic. And I'm so thankful Wardrobe uses uh, waterproof mascara. That's yeah. all I got to say. That's such a moving story. You know what hit me right there at the end? Of course, the fact that the 16-year-old boy had this idea and started all this, but we all know so many affluent, especially you from Beverly Hills, California. Yeah. We know these affluent women who get their nails done and get facials and get dermabrasion. For, for about $300, you can pay to have a child's cleft lip fixed. Isn't that amazing? And change the course of their whole life. Change right? everything about I mean, that's about what's unbelievable. Their future. She said that. She yeah. said that child would have been begging on the streets or dead. Mm -hmm. And with $500, they change the course of this child's entire destiny. Oh, no. Matt's story is such the power of, of being proactive. You know, look at Matt. He saw a problem mm -hmm. or an obstacle. And sometimes we see a problem or an obstacle and we just kind of back off. He saw an obstacle and turned it into an opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of, if you come out of a place of faith and not fear, obstacles become opportunities, you know. In Judaism, you know, every day you ask God to give you a fresh start. Mm -hmm. Literally, those words, you say, God, start my day anew, because the idea is that every day you can begin anew. 
that you don't have to be the person you were yesterday and that you can change the course of how your future is going to go. And I love that, especially when you've had a terrible yesterday. <laughs> you know that tomorrow can be different. That's right. you know? Well, that's, that's right. why I decided to call the show Naomi's New Morning. Mm -hmm. I think the word new and morning go together beautifully to remind us that it's all in our minds. Mm -hmm. We can change everything when we change our mind. Well, when we come back, it's time to take a trip down to that day one diner where they're always serving up a healthy discussion. And then, of course, later on, we're going to meet a funky artist whose music moves the body and the soul. So stay right there. <laughs> Back with my homegirls. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, this is our, our sign. No, Come on, Susan. Oh. <laughs> After yeah. learning that one. And Susan Sparks. Yeah. We're trying to, to break out of ruts today. We're talking about all that. So tell us what, what you guys talk about today one diner. Well, in in the whole idea of fresh starts, I got together with a few of my clergy friends down at the day one diner, and we discussed what happens when something horrible happens in your community, specifically to your family. Mm. Do you move? How do you handle it? Especially with your the town gossip. So you'll see what my friends had to say. Been there, done that. Yeah. I have a very interesting scenario. I actually know uh, the situation. Uh, you have a, a woman in your congregation, actually in, in my situation, knew someone who had a child who committed uh, a murder. Um, and the whole community kn knew about this and they wanted to start anew. Uh, the problem was is that the, the husband, um, well, he couldn't move because he was very close to retirement. And he had the health insurance, he would lose all of his benefits if they were to leave. And the family was in conflict. H how do you? How do you deal with this? How do you minister to somebody who needs to start again, but there's something pulling them back? Mm -hmm. So what did you tell your parishioner? Well, one of the things that we had a meeting with the entire family and said that there needs to be a shift uh, and try and figure out a way how can we make a shift uh, from this city to another city. I'm not always convinced about a geographical cure. It sounds like in that particular instance mm -hmm. it might have worked, mm -hmm. but we've had a few public scandals in my community. Mm -hmm. and it's actually the community that gave the family the much needed mm -hmm. support mm -hmm. and yes they're gossip and it's it's the talk but you know mm -hmm. what it's only the talk until the new scandal comes up right it's right. like Jennifer Aniston is only as popular until Angelina right. Jolie steps in I right. mean the gossip has a short shelf life mm -hmm. and even in our own but congregation. Not for the people experiencing it some people experience it to a point where it just seems like everybody's talking about me everybody mm -hmm. knows that mm -hmm. I'm the sense. one right. I'm, I'm the right. parent that did this or I'm the one that was involved with this and that's yeah. that's a heavy burden to yeah. to deal with when you walk into a room even though people right. aren't talking about you you think they you are. think they are but don't you think it's the job of the pastor or the rabbi to transform the congregation to gossip less and to oh, support you more? You think that's possible? You think that's possible? <laughs> oh, wow. Right. Yeah. I'd like to yeah. see that, Sherry. Well, in Sherry. our congregation, like there is Yeah, <laughs> please, yeah. take me there. Yeah. Scott was looking at me like, <laughs> are you crazy? No, actually, I was just about to say the same thing. I think there is some responsibility for the religious leader in that situation to talk to the community honestly. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that sure. honest conversation about this stuff actually helps to kind of to deal with with mm -hmm. the gossip mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about it from the pulpit, then it's not so interesting to whisper about in the church right. hallways. Right. And if you say, you That's know, good, this has been hard on mm -hmm. these right. people, it's That's hard good. on this community, and we are not going to be a community that becomes a community that holds a treasure of shame here for for these individuals. What we're going to do mm -hmm. is we're going to be redemptive. Now, the and not only that, the shame on you for talking about them. Well, I, I, yes, but maybe you don't need to say that directly. <laughs> uh, maybe know that's I implied. It. I said it in some very, very highly publicized mm -hmm. scandals in our community. I have said, shame on you for gossiping. You are here to what support the this family. People were embarrassed. I mean, they okay. knew. And you know what I said to them? 
this could be your kid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not that this kid is so right. but singularly think, unique. You know, in this case, in the question that was asked, uh, you know, Otis, one of the things that says to me that it might be good to have a geographical change is the crowd mm -hmm. and the fact of the influence and the fact of the continuing possibilities right. yeah. of further sure. damage. And we're dealing with it, you know, in this yeah. situation, and a teenager. I mean, if I have a teenager yeah. that way, I think it might be worth even sacrificing my job, my mm -hmm. retirement, right. whatever, to try to save my child. It's not yeah. either or. You don't have to move the entire family or not move. Oh. I've seen mm -hmm. families right. where the child's gone to boarding school or taken mm -hmm. a break from a high school and switched right. to a well, public I mean, high school. You're talking about people with resources and means. No, no, no. That's right. Who can go to boarding better. school? No, no, if you, no, no, no. It if, takes if, money to send a kid no, to boarding kids school. If one public school, they go to another well, public to another school. Public school but then the public school choices, I mean, get real. Depending on where you're living. Exactly. That's, that's, that uh, I think people very difficult. may not have yeah. the resources to and, take and their and child. And shifting public schools may be, put your child even in more danger. Exactly. If they're involved, if they're, the influence is yeah. gang influence. If it was a gang right. thing, they go to right. another school, the other gang, yeah. I right. mean, it's a, that's a tough scenario. Right. But I do want to get back to Scott's point and yours about the uh, responsibility of the leader in that faith community to make a statement and to bring things out into the light and to set some expectations expectations for the culture of how we're going to deal with okay, when so things what would go you say, wrong. Yvonne? Well, I would say exactly what you have said, that yes, there is a place to uh, say to the community, this has happened. And we all know it's happened. We can all grieve it, but we can also look for a place of healing and for the future and reconciliation. And to call the community to that, not, not everybody's going to come to play, but I think the leader has the responsibility. Right. And then to do that in conversation with that family, because families deal with issues differently as well. Yeah. How can we make mm -hmm. a difference so that other young men, young women don't go this way? You know, I right. mean, right. I think it's a call to action right. then for a faith community, mm -hmm. not only to minister to that family, but also to say something to that community. Yeah. And that was the scenario in this case was being able to call the community to action exactly. and mm -hmm. make sure that uh, this is That's not going to happen again, that we are very aware of what's going on right. uh, in the immediate neighborhood with our young people. What you got on your mind there? I could preach about this from the pulpit to the cows come home, but that's not going to open educational doors, uh, employment doors for this kid as they're growing up. That dad could telecommute, could commute. You know, the kid's stuck, the parent's not. So I think absolutely they ought to look for a new I, life. I would be a big supporter of relocating. Yeah. But you know, if it's, a, if, it, if it's a nationwide scandal, then everybody knows. But I would definitely take my kid and move to a different area. But it's hard. I mean, financially, not every family can do that. And... I mean, that's a difficult thing. I mean, and when you make a geographical cure, as I said, you're not necessarily curing the problem. So that's also well, a difficult instance, part. Well, for instance, wasn't in trouble, but when she was a teenager, she'd become known as the eccentric kid in school because she was so into music. She dressed like me. She wore vintage clothes, and she was considered odd. And she was very rebellious, and I knew that she needed a drastic change in her whole program. Mm -hmm. So we not only picked up and moved, but I changed her name from Christina wow. to Winona. Really? Yes, to really mark this metamorphosis. But then there's it? always the witness protection program <laughs> if you're really in trouble. That's so a now, if you've got <laughs> if you've got a topic that you would like to see us discussing on the Day One Diner, we want to hear from you. This show's about you. So you can visit our website, faithstreams.com. Just click on Message Board. And tell us what you're thinking. <laughs> We're going to meet Jenny Burton next. She's a spirited artist, and don't go away. <laughs> next Sunday at 11 on Hallmark Channel. For the sweet sounds, you got a hang of voice. <laughs> the sweet sounds of singer Jenny Burton, whose inspirational music can now be heard on New Watchfire's music label. And I'm very happy to have her right here with me live and in person. Welcome, Jenny. Good morning. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you've got a bit of a, an attitude growl going on there. Yeah, um, I think that a lot of people, when they see me, they expect one sound. And when they hear me, they get something I else. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. It makes it more Thank complex. You. And you've yes. been singing a long time. Yes, I have. Um, we don't want to put too many years on that. <laughs> well, how did you get into the inspirational music? Um, I, it's been a process because I've been a dance music artist. Um, I've done um, work for the Fortune 500 companies in the industrial field, and but gospel music. I don't know, and what do you mean? work in the Fortune 500? Uh, the uh, Fortune 500 companies are just the big organizations that do meetings and they do oh, yeah, industrials yeah, yeah. and yeah. so I've worked in that yeah. field for many years and so I, I believe you know I think um, 
if, if, if a lot of us are lucky, we, we, we just get back to home. Yeah. And um, as the, I the walk... The stuff we really want to do. Right. And I think uh, inspirational music is a composite for me of both gospel and a broader spectrum uh -huh. of concepts and things that I can sing about. And, I, and my roots were in gospel, R&B, and I in jazz. R &B. And in jazz. Yeah. You know, I mean, I heard jazz, didn't sing it, but I absorbed it over the years. And so I like being in a situation where I can bring a lot of things to bear. And you are. So yes. why watch fire? What? Um, it's a new um, uh, internet record company and record store. And, and I love it. You can download for free. Yes. I'm all about that. Yeah, I think that that's a great way to invite people to your music and to what you're doing. And then at a certain point, they don't mind purchasing, especially yeah. because they become a part of your support system. Well, it's you know? like when I go in, I can go to a department store and I want to sample the perfume. And walk around with it, and if then, then if it works, then I'll buy right. it. Right. So I, I love that. You were uh, raised in foster care. Yes, I spent 18 years there. Ouch. Yeah. So that's really influenced uh, your look on life. Uh, yes, and I think that I could only arrive at inspiration based on some of my experience as a young person yeah. and um, the moving through homes and the different experiences and having to leave places where I had been for a long time and getting used to parents and. That's areas of, of, of the world and then having to move on. You know, but the church, the inspiration of that, gospel music, singing, has always been a tapestry behind all of that movement and all of the change for me. And now, here's Jenny singing, and I think this song is well informed because you know what you stand for. She's yes. singing, I'll stand for you. Yes. <laughs> I'll lift your sword of truth to the battles you have fought. Well, I'll carry on your name so all the world will know of the light in you. God, let your light shine through. Shine on, shine on. And when it all said and done, those who know me will have known you too. This I hope to do. Step up, take. 
find out more about Jen and the other Watch of Our Artists and download their music for free by visiting us on our website at faithstreams.com. And we're going to be right back with more, so stick around. Oh, yeah, we're professional now. Quiet. Welcome, welcome back, everyone. <laughs> yeah, Sherry, Susan, and I are not joined by Timberly Whitfield, the host of our sister show, New Morning, which airs every weekday morning at seven, right here on Hallmark Channel. So, Timberly, tell us. <laughs> let's be serious I now. Know, okay. Tell us what's been going on. What's going to be going on this week? Well, speaking of fresh starts, we have some something new coming up on New Morning this week. We'll be featuring more artists from Watchfire, and. Um, they're inspirational singers and musicians from all walks of life. Uh, we've got an amazing woman, 22 years old, from Minnesota, to a fabulous guitar player from Boston. And uh, so we're looking forward to it all this week on New Morning. Oh, Start your on. morning with uh, Miss Cutie Patootie here and <laughs> some good music. Nice. Yeah. So we've been talking about fresh starts mm -hmm. today. That's the theme of our show. Let's uh, have some final thoughts starting over here. I just loved what you said, Naomi, that you can change your name and have a new fresh start because that's what you do in Judaism. When you've gone through a really challenging, difficult experience like cancer, mm -hmm. you, you give yourself a new name and it's so that people look at you like you're a new person. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I didn't know that. That's interesting. I know, well, isn't that? So call me Suziana. Okay. Oh, so that was, a, that <laughs> I like was the odd like, thing. I only like the Suzette. 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 Okay. Yeah. Suzette. Yeah. Suzette. Well, Suzette yeah. says. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, Naomi, there's so much to be learned from having a new start, a fresh start. But I think the most important is that we learn no matter what comes at us, mm. even if it defeats us, it will never define us. Okay. Yep. Say it again. I like that. It's yes, not no, matter, be... no matter what comes at us, even though it may defeat us, it will never define I us. I like that a lot. Ever. Mm. Yeah. In our culture, you know, so often fresh start is synonymous with New Year's resolution, you know. Oh, so you've got January 1st, you know, to figure it all out. Yeah. That one, one day out of the year. But, you know, it, the truth is, each day we wake up, mm. it's a new day. And we, are, we have that gift of a new day and a chance for a fresh start. Mm. Well, Sherry and Suzette, <laughs> and, and Tim, <laughs> so much like for being here with us this morning. And of course, I want to thank all of my guests for sharing their deeply personal stories with us today. And I think what, what we all saw is that you and I can break out of our negative ruts and change how we're feeling. Really, it's all in our mind. Whenever we feel trapped, uh, our mind is the answer. We actually saw a guy lose an incredible amount of weight. What was it, 247 yeah, pounds? Yeah. And then he ins inspired others to, to do the same thing. We saw a young man rescuing, now I remember, a 16-year-old boy, rescuing abandoned babies a whole continent away. And we even witnessed, remember the first story, young gang members putting on a, getting a new lease for life. So maybe your problems aren't quite as dramatic as that, but whatever it is that you're dealing with right now, uh, I just want to remind you that you can make a fresh start today. today. So I'm going to see you next week, hopefully. And remember, my mind is always open. My door is never closed. And my table is always here for you. So come on back next week. There's always room. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.